Hello, folks, and welcome back to Chris Wyatt Reports. It's Colonel Chris Wyatt live in central Pennsylvania with a special guest today. And my feature guest today is none other than Dr. John Labond. I've never asked you if that's the correct way to pronounce it. Is it Labond or do you say Labond or how do you say it? Uh, I said Laband, that's really a German name, so it's Laband, I suppose, but anyway. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Laband, okay. Well, we want to make sure we do our best to get it correct. It's a lot easier than some of the Zulu names and the Cosa names, uh, but yes. <laughs> to say the least. But uh, yeah. Dr. Laband uh, is a uh, subject matter expert on the history of the Zulu and uh, the 19th century and African conflicts, uh, and well, throughout the Southern Africa region. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, well, let's get started. Uh, for my international audience, um, your background's a little grainy, but that's a thatched roof behind you. A very uh, stereotypical sort of a historical um, dwelling in South Africa, is it not? Well, it is, except um, it, it's a fire risk insurance thing nowadays, so it's a, they're less popular than they used to be. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is your recent book, which I picked up on my trip to South Africa in January and all of February when I was there. And this book is The Boer... Oops, that's not going to come out very well. I've got this. i got to do it here because i got the green screen on. The Boer Invasion right. of Zulu Kingdom, 1837-1840. Now, you've written, published, edited, contributed to over two dozen books uh, throughout your long academic career. Uh, it, where does this book stand from a personal perspective? Is it one of your favorites or, or one of the most difficult you worked on? Can you tell us a little bit about the book from that perspective? Yeah, it, it's one I wanted to do for, for a long time, in fact, um, because I, at one stage in my life, once apartheid fell, um, I was invited to be part of a committee that was looking, in fact, at um, the whole problems of monuments and their place in a new South Africa and Blood River or the Ngome, um, which, which is this Battle of Blood River, is a very, very contentious one indeed. And and so I sat on this committee and one tried to sort of work out a new way of trying to sort of see this conflict um, in a way that's not just the old Boer perspective, the old colonial perspective, but one that had a Zulu perspective as well. And this is years ago, this is in the late 1990s. And ever since that, I thought I'd, I'd have loved to write about the whole thing and to try and give it my particular spin. And and this is an opportunity that, that, that came up. Well, speaking along those lines, you know, it's interesting because so far as the history of the Zulu side, because there's everyone has a side to the conversation, but the mm -hmm. Zulu side, was it challenging for historians given that there were so few written records at the time? Much of what we know, if I'm not mistaken, comes from oral history taken from veterans of these battles and of this time frame around mm -hmm. the 1890s. Did that present a challenge? Well, 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 this is right. And I think it's only f <clears throat> fairly recently that the James Stewart archive of recorded oral Zulu testimony actually became available. And that certainly has been a major source for me because here were people, many veterans of of the war itself or the, the sons or grandsons of those who had taken part. So, so this did give one a Zulu perspective. The problem is if you speak to present day Zulus, I mean, it's asking about, I mean, well, you can imagine asking somebody, what do you know about a war in the 1830s? The answer is really not that much, you know. So, so one is dependent on on this recorded oral testimony, of which, thank goodness, there is a, a fair amount. And, of course, the observations of um, those from the other side, not necessarily from the Boers, but from travelers like Adolphe de la Gorg, who's a, a French um, traveler and hunter who sort of picked up and was able to look at the whole scene and make his comments about it, people like that. So we do have, you know, voices or views at least outside those from the main protagonists. Well, presumably some of those other voices at the time would have been missionaries who were active in the region as well from, from throughout the world. Yes, um, not that many missionaries in this part of the world, in fact. Um, the You had um, Eras Erasmus Schmidt, who was, well, a sort of pseudo missionary um, with, with 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 the Boers. I mean, he wasn't really sort of, you know, properly in the church. But I mean, he was, you know, he, he was there. He, took, <laughs> he, he was there, and he took services and stuff. He was there, and he kept a diary, which is jolly useful. Um, and you had Captain Alan Gardner, who was indeed a missionary in the area, but he he left before the war actually began. So, but you do have people like 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 Owen, who was another missionary who was actually at Mgonga Clovo and was actually able to watch the, the, the killing of Ratif and, and, and his fellow 
and his fellows on on that embassy. So so you do have some of these outside visions as um, voices as well. Yes. Well, as far as now, as a historian, a fellow historian, this is something that often comes up. People try to um, poo poo or discount the oral testimony of people when it comes to history and and there are reasons for that let's let's be fair i mean memories yeah. memories get clouded we we tend to remember what went well and what we did well and not the things we failed at and we oftentimes tend to look back on the good old days so to speak when things were better uh, but that said oral history can in fact prove to be a very valuable resource. Um, you know, the the Icelandic sagas were were dismissed for a long time, and come to find out with yeah. archaeological research, there's a lot of truth. Obviously, not you know two headed da- dragons and stuff like that, yeah, but, but there's a, yeah. a lot of truth to the sagas. Yeah. Would you agree that uh, oral history, despite sometimes getting a bad reputation, is a very valuable source for historical research and writing? Oh, it is. It's absolutely essential. I mean, in a continent like Africa, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, there is very little written record or the written record is indeed recorded testimony of one sort or another but but what i find interesting about the oral testimony about a war like this is that blood river which is the great climactic battle there's very little about that in the zulu recorded testimony on the other hand a subsequent battle a battle of the white and flows or parte where the Zulu's actually won. There's a great deal of recorded evidence about that. So, so people's <laughs> memories, indeed, you remember the good things and you try, you, you brush the bad ones under the carpet. Yeah. Well, the Battle of the White Infelosi, I'm not at all surprised as you'll remember that because, uh, as I recall, um, the Boers decided to go try to just end this thing once and for all. And uh, they got snookered. Hey, there's a bunch of cattle down here. Seemed yeah. a little too enticing for the Boer leaders, and they fell for it and had their hat handed to them. Is, is that an accurate description of the, of the you know, summary of the battle? Yeah. Well, well, well that, that's absolutely it. And in fact, the Zulu were deliberately walking around or, or at least crouching around with, with their cowhide shields so on their backs. So they'd look like um, cattle from a distance. They're looking like cattle from a distance, yeah. But I mean, you know, so that war actually didn't end with a great victory of Blood River. It actually ended with a defeat. And then the Boers re- retreated and the war actually ended then with a negotiated peace for the time being. You know, it was a kind of stalemate, in fact. Yeah, and in fact, you know, the thing that's always puzzled, I think, people not very familiar with what happened in uh, in what was Natal and, and the Zulu land at the time mm-hmm. is that most of the Boers, not long mm-hmm. after this, already mm-hmm. by the 1850s had abandoned Natal and moved into the high veld. They moved back over the Drakensberg up into the Free State and what became the South African Republic or the Transvaal, abandoning yeah. it for a variety of reasons. But I mean, mm-hmm. if it was a great victory, uh, you'd think there'd be uh, an established kingdom, or not kingdom, but an mm-hmm. established state there, which was only a briefly a state and then it disappeared pretty quickly after two years. Well, well, the reason really for that is the sort of, um, the, the factor off the stage for half of that, and that is Britain, and the Cape Colony and the British imperial interests that, um, you know, it's something we, we often get wrong about the British Empire. They were actually dragged into the interior um, by their subjects from the Cape actually marching off, um, causing great eruptions among the people of the interior, which threatened to dis- destabilize the borders of the Cape. I mean, as far as the British were concerned, the Cape was an important strategic point on the way to India and what and happened in the that's interior. It. That's it. And, that's and, and that's it. I mean, I mean, diamonds hadn't been discovered yet. Gold hadn't been discovered yet. There's nothing except a lot of trouble in the interior. So the British were there. And there was this troublesome community of hunter traders at Port Natal, nowadays Durban, who had settled on the coast of the Zulu kingdom and had this rather fraught relationship with the Zulu monarch and were constantly trying to get the British to come in and actually annex them to raise the flag. And the British were saying, forget it, absolutely not. But it's only once the Boers had set up their republic and were then pushing further south against the eastern frontier of the Cape that the British thought, really, this is too much. This is really, really troublesome. We're going to have to stop it. And so it's the British intervention that actually pushes the Boers out. But I mean, right in the beginning, the Boers had divided. Half of them had stayed in the high field. Only some of them went down into Natal. So you went back and joined your brothers, so to speak, over the Drakensberg. 
Well, you know, it's it's interesting you mention that because uh, not to defend the Brits, uh, certainly not my place here, but but it's not the first time and it's not uncommon for this sort of thing to happen. I mean, we look at what happened in Virginia. We see that the the, 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 the British government established a line of demarcation in which yeah. white settlers could not go any further west. And yeah. because they were extended no protections uh, and the, the, the groups west of there, the indigenous population yeah. were afforded their freedoms. But yeah. um, the land proved to be too lucrative with uh, bison and a great hunting grounds and farmland and so white settlers poured across the Appalachians into Kentucky into Tennessee mm. and they got attacked and then they screamed for help from the crown and then later from the American government dragging both of those governments into that against the Native Americans there who they had no desire right. yeah and then it's not just yeah, that I mean, mean, Carl Peters in, in in German Southwest Africa tried yeah, for years yeah. to get Bismarck to annex an African colony eventually it happened but it was not because of his good offices it was for other reasons no, no, exactly. So, no, it's a precisely the same, same situation. Yep, yep. So, the, the situation in in Natal with the uh, with the Boers who came down there. Now, this this okay. Now, I'm going to sound like a rube here, because, but this is for yeah. my audience. Okay? okay. If you travel South Africa and you drive mm -hmm. around, you discover that there's actually more favorable terrain north east of the Drakensberg. Mm -hmm. The Drakensberg are in the view yeah. behind me here, by the way, folks. That's the northern yeah. reach yeah, of the Drakensberg. Yeah, I recognize them, yeah. You recognize yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. if you go a little further north, you can go around and you can come down mm -hmm. in Natal without too much difficulty, an epic struggling of oxen up over the high mountains and such. Um, is, is there a reason why they just didn't go a little further north and come down? or Because the stories were told, or is this mythology about the, the trek bore columns going through the Drakensberg, disassembling mm -hmm. their weapons, piece by, or not weapons, their, their, their cards right, piece right. by piece, coming down the other side. When, if you go a little further north, I mean, I realize Van Rienen Pass isn't the easiest to get through, mm -hmm. but it's a heck of a lot easier than what you see behind me. <laughs> well, further north, there's one simple word, malaria. <laughs> well, not that far north. Not that far not north. That, well, though, that, that, that's where Louis Trichard and others others went through originally. I mean, I mean, one possibility was trying to make connection with Delago Bay and the Portuguese as as an outlet to trade and and for their very important items like gunpowder, coffee, and, and other 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 necessities for for Boer life. Um, the, further north, around the 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 north of the Drakensberg, sure, it is somewhat easier. But then they hadn't actually explored that particular part yet. I mean, and they'd already run into trouble with um, people like the um, Kluby and others. Um, so you, there were other polities there as well. I mean, there, there's, there are the Basutu, there are the Kluby, there are the Maklokwa. Um, the there are all sorts of people living around that part of the world. I mean, so the Drakensberg seemed the most direct route over, and it just seemed... The one they took. Indeed, I mean, where they did cross wasn't that far from going around the north, or around Harrismith, etc. But that's the route they seem to have taken, where their their scouts discovered these routes, and that's what they decided on. Oh, I'm just saying, if I was Pete Ice or or Pot Geeter, I might have hired better scouts. Huh? I, I, yeah, I, I would have gone <laughs> slightly further north. <laughs> further north, and then come in, and then you're come right. in from that side. It would have been a little bit it's easier. A lot of, yeah, but you're right. Idea. There, there were a lot. Of, there were a lot of polities there, and of course, um, this mm. is a consequence of people actually being from the area and settled mm. there for centuries, as well as Infokane, yeah. which had had a big impact yeah. on dispersing people throughout the region. And that all That's plays right. into the historical narrative of the uh, for Connor and the Trek Boers is is yeah. walking into largely empty spaces in what was the free mm. state. Uh, but that mm. wasn't a natural consequence. It was a consequence yeah. of uh, the Infokane and the turmoil that happened there, was yeah. it not? Yes or no is my answer. Because, oh, okay. Mm. Okay, because cause, cause, cause what one forgets is that Africa at that stage was still enormously underpopulated. Sure. The populations are very small. I mean, the Zulu kingdom, how many subjects do they have? Quarter of a million at the outside. And that was big. Um, and, and that was big. You're looking at some of these smaller people on the high field, 50,000, 30,000, 40,000, you know, quite small numbers. And so you've got these small groups anyway, and you have a countryside where lots of it's actually not much used for agriculture or indeed doesn't have the optimum um, grazing, winter and summer grazing for your, for your, for your herds either. So, so those areas who actually can settle are fairly, fairly small. So you find people are concentrated, congregate around the best bits, leaving lots of empty space in between. But then, of course, what has happened, this kind of um, this ricocheting effect of state building, pushing other people out, migrating, hitting, 
hitting communities, forcing them off. So that has certainly led to a lot of, not so much a, not so much empty land, but land temporarily abandoned, while people sort of took refuge in mountains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as far as the Boers are concerned, it was pretty unpopulated, but they didn't quite get the right impression. But then you've got the Interbeli Kingdom, which is one of the major sort of um, migratory states that have pushed out of the Zululand area and now into the Highfield, and they deliberately created a sort of cordon sanitaire around their kingdom um, to, to keep enemy raiders out, kind of empty space, which they deliberately forced empty to for, for their own security. So, yeah. So as I say, yes and no is the answer. <laughs> well, and of course, uh, Mzila Kazi and, and, and Nebele uh, preyed upon their neighbors. Uh, they love that cordon sanitaire because it gave them yeah. space to maneuver yeah. as they attacked. And in fact, um, you know, when I talked to Afrikaners, a lot of mm. a lot of times you talk to Afrikaners today mm. that want to mm. self-divide and isolate, which seems to be a big part of the yeah. history of that people. Um, yeah. One of the things I tell them is you have a lot of natural allies. I mean, just go back in your mm. history here. The, mm. In order to unite against Mzila Kazi, uh, you had mm. a lot. You had the, you had the Borlong. You had... You had the Griquas who were in the area. Yeah. Uh, you also yeah. had Basutu peoples, Tswana peoples who yeah. allied, yeah. at least on a um, you know uh, an alliance of convenience, if nothing else, mm. to go and raid and attack Mzilakazi to stop that and eventually chase them north of Limpopo. So you know it's an interesting story for me that people seem to forget history that this history is intertwined and it's with black ass mm. South Africans and white South Africans who at times mm. fought each other and at times actually worked together. Well, 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 this is right. I mean, it's the, the, the Drosters, to give them their basic name, you know, of the, the, these people on the high felt who were people of, of mixed race, um, either from slaves or the local Khoisan population, who dressed like Boers. They fought like Boers. They had wagons. They had houses. They, they, they operated were, they were like Dutch them. Calvinist. They, had they spoke off their guns. All the rest of it. So, so I mean, so, so when the Boers actually arrived, they were sort of like yet another element of the same on the high felt. Um, but I think, you know, what you say is very true that in colonial situations, one always forgets it's not always the colonizers against the rest. It's always a question of the colonizers with a lot of the indigenous people against other indigenous people. Whether you start with Cortes against the Aztecs, the story, you know, with, with his allies. Oh, the, there, the there's story there's no way that he would have won with that handful of people. It wasn't for thousands no. of other uh, Mesoamericans who were angry at the Aztecs. No. Yeah, and I mean, the, the Sixth Cape Frontier War, which really is sort of one of the main reasons the Boers left the Eastern Cape. Um, I mean, there, the Mfengu and other people were major figures on the side of, of the, Brit of the British. Um, and when the Boers left, it wasn't an all-white party. They went with not only all their herds, but all, all their retainers, some of whom were ex-slaves, some of whom were not. And in many of the battles that were fought... Um, you had lots of people of color actually fighting with the Boers against the Zulu, and and, and especially the Port Natal um, hunter traders. They had a large force of um, armed armed um, followers, if you like, who who were in fact local Zulu. You know, so so it is a very mixed bag. No, I think it's an important consideration when people talk about South African history because of the, the history of um, the National Party and the policy of apartheid. People look at everything through a lens of racism. And yeah. these uh, there, there may have been disparaging, there may have been elements of racism back in the time. But aside from that, people still work together and against each other for whatever their yeah. purposes were. Yeah, no, that's absolutely so. I mean, if we move later to the Anglo-Zulu War, which is sort of so well known, I mean, there is many... Natal Africans fighting with the British. They were British soldiers, you know. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're jumping around a bit here, but I think if the I audience know. is finding it enjoyable, I hope you're enjoying the conversation. I know I am. Yeah. So let's, yes, let's, sir. let's, we'll jump, we'll skip past Dingana, or as I prefer to call him Dingani. Yeah. I, I learned, grew yeah. up yeah. saying Dingani, but yeah. we'll skip past yeah. Dingani. We can always come back to him and Pete Retief and yeah. Blaukrans yeah. and, and all that later. Yeah. But, but I want yeah. to go to uh, the Battle of Blood River, Unkome. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. battle that took place. Now, a lot of people look at this as, um, you know, because it's part of the story or the mythology, however you prefer to view it, <laughs> of what was <laughs> built up as they were attacked by the Zulu. But, both sides were itching for a fight, it seems, in this battle. Yeah. The, the Boers yeah. went, this wasn't a typical, you know, wagon train. This was men who were ready to fight, and they were prepared. Yeah. They came prepared. They even brought some, you know, some artillery with them, some small yeah. artillery. Yeah. And they were yeah. looking for the Zulu for a divisive mm. engagement. And the Zulu were looking to stop them and blunt yeah. them and chase them back. I mean, that's, it's yeah. really, 
in, in the military, we have a term called a meeting engagement. And really, I would describe yeah. this as a meeting engagement. Both armies yeah. out looking, scouts yeah. trying to find, and then zero yeah. in, and then you have a beat. Was that accurate? Yeah. It is. And, and for a certain way, it, it is a rather desperate situation for the Zulu because just earlier earlier in the year in August, they had fought the Battle of Fechla, where the Boers were in their, their strongly really entrenched encampment. And in two and a half, nearly three days of fighting, they tried again and again against this fortified all-round position, and it failed to break through. So, so there is this knowledge that if the Boers, in their normal, when you're on commando, you've got your wagons, you're going to be lagering as they're doing the whole way, they knew this was going to be incredibly difficult, you know, having lost one battle already, um, fought, fought that way. On the other hand, they had to stop the Boers because they were homing in on Mgunga Clover, which was the, the King, King Dingan's um, capital. So, indeed, there had to be a meeting. There had to be a desperate effort to make it work. And they certainly put together the biggest army they, they, they put together in the entire war. They, they threw everything they had at this, basically. And it, it appears almost, uh, look, I mean, the Zulu weren't stupid. They, they knew that the lager was in this, these circumstances with these opposing forces, the most effective means to engage for the Boers. It really was. It gave them yeah. the ability to just, you know, sit back and defended and, and just, you know, mobile fortress, essentially, that allowed them to attack their opponent. So the Zulu weren't stupid. They, they knew that it was going to be tough. And I suspect they... They anticipated heavy losses, but as you said, it was desperation. They had to do something, and this yeah. is where they chose to engage. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems is, as so often with Zulu attacks, it became uncoordinated, if you like. The, the left wing moved in advance of the right, um, but even so, I don't think that made that much of a difference because, you know, we look at the disparity of numbers, you know, thousands against hundreds, and yet the actual defensive perimeter is very small. So, if the Zulu had a hundred men or ten thousand men, there was still only going to be a hundred men facing that actual right. They're, they're trim tripping, perimeter, yeah. tripping over each other, and there's only so much space Absolutely. to advance. Now that's right, and and certainly the later stage of the battle, you get the those in the front trying to push back, and those behind pushing forward, and you know, um, trampling each other and all the rest of it. So, so yeah, I mean, larger numbers make no difference in 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 that kind of situation. I mean, in a standard battle in the open, in the open field, so to speak, where you're trying to envelop the enemy and surround them. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, large numbers play a part, but not in this kind of defensive situation. It's and, like the Battle of Rourke's Drift or whatever, you know, to, to look ahead to the Anglo-Zulu War, you know? Exactly. Well, that's what I was going to get at. You know, you see Shard and, and you see um, uh, Bromville. Um, yeah. They, you know, Shard takes the mealy bags and all the, the sandbags and piles them up. Yeah. And, and yeah. basically, they wind up with automatic weapons fire, in essence, first rank fire, second rank fire, third rank, first rank fire. And, you know, it was it was absolutely brilliant. But, I mean, it yeah. was desperation. It was either that or die. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. you got, yeah. now that neither one of them <laughs> Had particularly illustrious military careers after that, but they did get the Victoria Cross right. for that action. Well, they did, like, like rats in a trap, as they say. They had to fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas with in this case of Blood River, not only it was the logger um, effective, but it was, if you look at the terrain today, it was pretty well situated. Although where the where the yeah. memorial, the, where the the bronze wagon are, aren't the exact yeah. spot, but it's it it not not quite right. right. Yeah, but you no, see no. the bend, you see the banks of yeah. that river, yeah. and you can see yeah. it's also kind of fast flowing at the right time of year. I don't know how it was on that day, yeah. but uh, that's that's it, a tough spot. No, it was fast flowing. I mean, it had been. Very, very rainy, in fact, for, for a long time. So the river was full. Um, yeah, but I mean, so basically the lager, um, only two sides of it, two of the four sides effectively, were, were open to attack. The rest were protected by, by the river and the large um, donga or gully or whatever in, in, along the other side. So, so yeah, so it, it was very well placed indeed. Well, in fact, at um, one stage, if not throughout the day, because it started in the morning and went till yeah. uh, afternoon, early afternoon, I think. Yeah. But at uh, one stage, uh, the boars um, had, you know, it was like a turkey shoot. There were so many Zulu yeah. trapped in the river trying to cross or cower down there yeah. to hide from fire. Yeah. Withering fire came and probably killed dozens, if not hundreds more Zulu in the river. Yeah. No, no, surely. I mean, it was, and, and we know that they were trying to hide under the water and breathing through reeds and all the rest of it. Yeah, but so, and I mean, and the, the, I mean, the whole point about battles like this is not just defending against the attack. It's the moment you can counterattack and open up and open up the wagon line and, and, and let out your mounted men, you know, and that turns a, a repulse into a into a rout. And that's that's where much of the killing takes place in those kind of pursuits. 
Well, in fact, yeah, you, and you see if you if you look at the uh, the Anglo Boer War, you'll see some battles where an awful lot of the people who who were shot were shot in the back as they fled away yeah. from besieging. That's right. Uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy yeah. stuff. So let me yeah. ask you this question about the Zulu, because I mean, your book is very interesting, very fascinating from the standpoint that uh, you spend a fair amount of time in here describing the culture of the Zulu Kingdom, uh, yeah. all the different um, pieces and parts of it, the the settlements, mm-hmm. the the King's mm-hmm. Kraal, all the different mm-hmm. attender attendees and attend and all the different things. Um, what I found very interesting in the book was that, because I learned some things from that, because I'm, I'm not that deeply steeped in, in the inner workings of the Zulu kingdom. But one thing that's always struck me is that the nature of the kingdom that Shaka formed and the growth mm-hmm. of, the, of the, the Zulu is that they were structured yeah. in such a way that it almost seems like they had to be militaristic and expansionist. Otherwise, mm-hmm. they couldn't keep their impies busy and there was always a chance it would turn on and the whole thing would fall apart. Is, is, mm-hmm. it, is it a reasonable um, assessment to say that the, the Zulu Empire at that stage in the 1830s, mm-hmm. 1840s, mm-hmm. had to be militaristic and had mm-hmm. to raid their enemies for cattle and to grow so they could hand out spoils and patronage mm-hmm. to keep the king in power or the whole thing might have fallen apart politically? Yes, I think, look, it's just like the Ottoman Empire later on, and earlier, I mean, in, in the 15th and 16th century, which was constantly expanding, and and that's how it worked. And and once, once it reached limits, the thing began to sort of implode in, in on itself. So, yeah, I mean, the Zulu kingdom definitely depended on gathering tribute, attacking, attacking your enemies, I mean, um, rewarding your, your chief men and all the rest of it. So it was a supposed to be continually expand, not even so much expanding, but been able to raid and attack neighbors to bring in uh, the, the cattle and and which was absolutely necessary for the kingdom to go on so so yeah so it is a military kingdom it's created as a military kingdom it's the most militarized in the neighborhood and that's how it actually continues i mean that's sort of its being in fact well, you know, and, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, uh, most of its rulers, not all, but most of its rulers uh, disappear from the scene by being murdered or assassinated until later on. Yeah. Was, yeah. Was, was, only, was, was Mpande the first that actually lived out his natural life? <laughs> yeah, no, no, he, he was, in fact. I mean, even today, I mean, the, the latest Zulu king here, that succession was hugely um, contested, except they went to the Supreme Court. They didn't kill each other. <laughs> well, they went to law instead. There's definitely <laughs> definitely an improvement from that standpoint. We've yeah, turned to the courts yeah. instead of to, to the Asagai. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. yikes. No, it's... Uh, it's <laughs> Sorry, I, I just can't. But, you know, back to Blood River. Um, I went there before the Friendship Bridge was, was erected. Um, yeah, so you yeah. had to drive all the way around to get. And I did. Right, I yeah. made the effort to drive all the way around to get to the Zulu side, yeah. which was quite a headache. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. quite a nice and impressive site when it was first built, that building. And and yeah. I really liked it because the, it showed both sides. And it was there was there may have been animosity. But as a tourist traveling yeah. there or as a historian, yeah. I wasn't seeing it openly, the animosity at the time. It was more yeah. of a reconciliation. Yeah. Uh, the bridge yeah. is lovely, um, but uh, I was just there in Feb or late January, excuse me, and it's the first mm-hmm. time I've been there in two decades or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The bridge is lovely, but the Zulu site is largely being ignored. Um, I don't know if yeah. it's because it's financed by the government at national level or provincial level mm-hmm. or what. Uh, it's not dilapidated, but it looks like it hasn't been maintained in those 20 years. Maintained, yeah. And in addition, they all absconded. No one was there. It was open hours, and there wasn't a damn person anywhere at the site. I wanted to go and look around. I could walk around inside, yeah. but I wanted to talk to people, and there was no one working. They just, I don't know if they're getting paid, but they weren't there. It's very disappointing. Mm-hmm. It is, but I mean, it's it's unfortunately rather symptomatic of the way things operate nowadays, in fact. And I mean, I mean, the bridge itself was supposed to be built right at the beginning. Yeah, and it and wasn't. Well, we won't get... And we won't go into the scandals about why it wasn't, but it wasn't. So, so it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but it came later. But, you know, it's not just there. Yeah. I also went to Isan Luana, and I hadn't been there in yeah. some time either. And yeah. I, I'm actually heart sore as a historian about the, mm-hmm. the dilapidated state of that battle site. The, the, yeah. the, Pla- the the oh, di- not diorama but the um, the plaque or, or you know scene that's there it sits on a little you know metal legs and it I don't know it's yeah. about two meters by three meters and it depicts the battle you can't mm. see it the plastic mm. covering it is washed it's out all, yeah. completely yeah. and everywhere on the battlefield that's the situation the only thing that looks like it's yeah. fresh is they repaint the rocks where the cairns are yeah. every so often yeah. I mean uh, this is an epic victory for the Zulu people when they just yeah. wiped out that entire column you'd think the Zulu people would have enough pride in their history that maybe they would do it on their own if it's not the government yeah. well I don't know I mean it's, it's it's lack of funding it's I mean all you know it's just um, as I say 
symptomatic of so much else. So, no, no, it is. So, but yeah. I mean, but I mean, yeah, look, yeah. I'm not throwing stones at the Zulu, but I mean, yeah. by contrast, yeah. the the folks that run the Four Tracker Monument also responsible for the uh, the Boer side of the Blood River Memorial, and yeah. they maintain both of those. They're not funded with one penny from the government. So I yeah. mean, you know, I, I think the Zulu people should, you know, try to. Uh, obviously, a lot of Zulu people live in poverty. Let's be honest about yeah. that. Uh, but I mean, yeah. somebody ought to step up who's a prominent Zulu and say, hey, this is our heritage. We should be taking care of yeah. this. I know, and I mean, in fact, I mean, annu annually things of events happen at St. Luan and all the rest of it, so you would think so, but I mean, it's been a problem for years and years, these sites, um, um, vandalism and all the rest of it's always been a part of the, the name of the game, and yeah, and it's just, yeah, so many of our monuments are in that state, and I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, I'm, yeah, so that's, so that's, as I say, where we are. Yeah, no, I'm always of the opinion that rather than tear down monuments, let's build more monuments. And in this case, I yeah. think they should build more monuments. <laughs> but uh, the, the, now the nature of the Zulu kingdom at this time is, you know, um, I think for some respects for the board, maybe they didn't realize the situation they were in. And you can give me your assessment of, of my analysis mm. here. Uh, they seem to think they can go and wipe out the Zulu kingdom. That'd be it. But uh, the, the, the king's kraal was really mobile. They would pick it up and move if they needed to. And in fact, did do that several times. Yep. So I think the only way you could have taken out the Zulu is to decisively defeat the king, which would lose to a loss of face and, yep. and maybe you know execute him. But you couldn't just attack their capital and, and destroy the Zulu. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, I, I think it is, and in fact, in a way, what what wrecked Tingan's efforts to move was he was moving north into Swa into the Swazi Kingdom, hoping to take over that, and lost a major battle, the Battle of Labuya, um, which that really put an end to it, because there's nowhere for him to go, having been so badly defeated in that particular battle. So, in a way, you can argue what brought Tingan and the old Zulu Kingdom down wasn't so much the Boer victory as a defeat by the Swazi, you know. Well, essentially, because the Zulu for a long time actually coveted the Swazi kingdom. They wanted that, didn't they? Yeah. They sent parties yeah. up there to try to engage them. And then when, when, when they were looking to get away from the Boers or, or move, they actually sent scouts up to what at the time was Lorenco Marx and today's yeah. Mozambique, now Maputo. Yeah. And, of course, that's yeah. a malaria yeah. zone. <laughs> yeah, no, right. No, no. And indeed, I mean, Sh I mean, Shaga's great, great, great campaign in, 19, in 1829, I mean, uh, I mean, Enormous casualties had moved in, moved into into that particular region, but but the Zulu kept on raiding the Swazi Kingdom way up into the 1850s. In fact, on a on a regular basis, um, they're the sort of traditional enemy. They're the hunting ground, if you like, you know, and, and that carried on. But they never decisively defeated them. No. Um, one reason is that the Swazi were very good at taking to their caves and defending them. Um, um, not in fact engaging in set piece battles and what's unusual about labuya is that for once they decided on a great set piece battle and actually won it you know so so that was against against the grain if you like well that was a bit unusual but of course that yeah. that meant the end of dingani that was it for him yeah it was yeah and uh, those who were left uh, after after that horrific defeat, most of them just eventually found their way back south and, and came back yeah. because there really wasn't anything for them there yeah yeah Indeed, and and of course, in the end, I mean, what really brings Dingani to end is a civil war against his brother, his brother Mpande, who um, joins up for the Boers, wins a battle, defeats Dingani, and is then recognised as the new Zulu king. So, so he did a good deal. Well, in fact, as you mentioned earlier, it, it wasn't the Boers who, who took out Dingani; it was, in fact, Mpande and the Zulu themselves. Yeah, right? this is right. I mean, I mean that 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 particular battle. I mean. Um, effectively was Zulu against Zulu. The Boers were on a commander, which was actually busy collecting cattle and other loot, and, and never actually got to the battlefield. So it was a Zulu on, it was a Zulu, on Zulu affair, yeah. They were, they were lingering and not moving with any alacrity. No, they were certainly lingering and drinking and having a good party and collecting cattle, yeah. <laughs> and let the Zulu go about the business of killing each other. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I suppose it's a plan if you're in charge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, then they, they gathered in lots of apprentices as they caused their little, you know, well, effectively slaves that they took as well, you know, so, yeah. Well, let's go back kind of to the beginning and uh, the story which has become, an, um, I don't want to say mythology, although people who disparagingly call it mythology, but certainly the, the narrative, the story of the Trek Boers and the, the Afrikaner mm -hmm. nation being forged. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, goes back to them coming across the Drakensberg mm -hmm. and coming down into Natal and Zululand. Mm -hmm. 
and mm-hmm. uh, meeting up with Dingani um, and mm-hmm. um, asking if this is a story, asking if they could, you know, mm-hmm. settle on the land. And he said, well, sure. Mm-hmm. I want you to go um, do me a favor, though. you got to recover these cattle that were stolen from mm-hmm. us, which apparently mm-hmm. was years ago or something like that. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, they, they went on a punitive raid and they collected cattle and they brought it back and, and they all had a feast and had a good time. And supposedly signed a treaty and then and mm-hmm. they came back to celebrate the treaty and you know the, the, i think I, I try to put myself in the shoes of Ding, of, of uh, pete retief's party yeah. when you walk yeah. into the king's crawl and look i mean you can you can elaborate on this in a moment i know they did all sorts of things either intentionally or more likely probably unintentionally of insulting yeah. the zulus with their customs and 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 being abusive in ways they probably didn't even realize but uh, mm-hmm. which really <laughs> kind of puts them at a disadvantage and i don't think they realize yeah. that but yeah. um I got I try to put myself in the shoes of Pete Retief and the guys who went in there like okay no you have to leave your weapons out here it's a sign of respect for the king and then you're suddenly surrounded by all these people in, in, mm-hmm. in a kingdom that's very militaristic either they're very naive or they were very arrogant I'm not sure which it was but um, to get yourself in that situation uh, I you know I, I don't know that I would have joined Retief's party going for the signing of the treaty I, I think arrogance as much as anything else um, though naivety certainly I think you know, you, you, you're looking at two parties with rather different visions. Um, and, and different worldviews. And different worldviews. You've, you've got Retief coming in, um, and they feel they can do a deal and negotiate land, and, and that's that. From the Zuda perspective, I mean, they are a conquering people. This is their world. And suddenly, over the Drakensberg, or at the wrong path of the Drakensberg, for the Drakensberg anyway, come a thousand wagons and tens of thousands of livestock, weapons. thousands of people, and, wef- and of course, carrying all these weapons. Um, and they arrive and s- they settle down and immediately start gathering food from, 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 from the various homesteads well, because, around. Let me interrupt you, John, just for a second there, because yeah. a lot of the people were fearful that they arrived, say, when they're at the base of the mm-hmm. Drakensberg, and they fled, and yeah. they'd had food stores of grain, and they yeah. found them yeah. like, oh, these are abandoned, we can take it. We can take it right, exactly. So, so, in other words, as from the Zulu perspective, they're going on as if they've conquered this land and they're living here. You know, who do they think they are? On the other hand, Dingan is no fool. He's absolutely aware that these same Boers have defeated the Indabeli, who the Zulu have never succeeded in defeating, but the Boers have, and they've chased them, you know, chased them north. So, so here are an extremely dangerous people. They also know about what's been happening in the Eastern Cape with the Klaza and so on. I mean, they know that fighting the Boers is no easy matter. So here really is a kind of existential threat. So what do you do? Um, how, 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 do you, how do you handle this? And I think the opening moves um, when Retief goes for the first time is a kind of feeling out, trying to see, trying to negotiate. And the king, his advisor saying, listen, these people are dangerous. You've got to get rid of them. If, you know, And I think something else you have to understand, the Zulu have no real perception of how many they are. In other words, okay, here are the numbers that are over the Drakensberg. How many more are coming? Sure. How many are more coming? They don't know. They're not sure about that. So it seems feasible in a surprise attack to actually wipe out this whole party and be done with it. And I, and I do believe, as you say, there are all sorts of reasons why the Zulu felt insulted the way the Boers went on and all of that kind of thing. But in the end, simmering throughout this the whole time, wasn't the idea of a, a land deal. I mean, when Dingan was negotiating with Retief, he was giving away parts of the land south of Tugela River. Which, which he, he didn't even to, own. He didn't even own which that. He, <laughs> which, he'd given to, which he'd given to the missionary Captain Gardner as chief. So, I mean, it wasn't even <laughs> his to give away. So, so I mean, it, he's not being that serious about it. We know the treaty that's signed is signed by nobody important, it seems, on the Zulu side. So, so it's all a game you're playing with the intention always, I think, of attacking the Boers. And... You know, we've all watched Game of Thrones and all the rest of it, and we see what happens at banquets. You know, um, it's the oldest story in the book. I mean, you see it get in Herodotus and all the rest of it. Invite the enemy to a banquet, kill them all, and we move on from there. And I think, you know, so this is the plan. And Dingan, when you see the um, his meetings with the missionary Owen afterwards, Dingan's cock a hoop. He's really pleased with how clever he's been in in cutting off the head and then sending off the army to finish off 
the the rest of the Boers in their encampment. So, yeah, I, I think it's a fairly deliberate ploy, but but one where if you are counting the possibilities, to engage them in battle is not going to be an easy thing. You know that you could well be defeated. So this is the other way. Take them by surprise and eliminate them. Well, subterfuge, it, it, it does the trick in deception. Yeah. As, as, yeah. A, as a, an intelligence officer in the military, yeah. um, mm-hmm. I have to say that probably the, the truck bores in Natal were poorly served by their intelligence. They, not, not, yeah. their, not their own personal intelligence, but yeah. military no, no, intelligence. But- uh, they really, I mean, the fact that he was offering them land that was owned by the, the Port Natal mm-hmm. settlers and others uh, is, it should have you know, put yeah. some red flags up. The fact that the people yeah. that, that put their mark on the treaty were not mm-hmm. the immediate circle of the king and his advice. Advisors, but just you know, just other Zulu. That should have been a red flag. Yeah, yeah that yeah, should have yeah. been a red flag. Yeah. Look, the from the Zulu from their point point of view, um, the the way militarily the Zulu operated, you always sent out spies. You sent out spies often years before, like when King Shaga was thinking of invading the Mpondo Kingdom to the south. He had spies implanted in there about two years before he ever set out. So. So there were spies all over the Boer encampments, all over the high field. So the Zulu had a very good idea of what the Boers were doing and what they're about and what they're what they're planning to do. On the other hand, as you say, the Boers had really very little idea of what 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 the Zulu were about. So all the, you know, intelligence gathering was on the one side, but not on the other. And we see the results. What what comes of it? Yeah. You know. Now here's yeah. something that, that this this particularly strikes a horrible chord with the Afrikaans community, uh, mm-hmm. and that's uh, and, and l- let me explain it from my perspective as an yeah, analyst, sure. and I'll get your take on it. So they sent the impies out immediately after you know taking out the wizards, as they described them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they they went out to uh, Blaukrans and Dinan, and they attacked them. These disparate these mm-hmm. these wagons that were all over the place. There are only a few mm-hmm. crawls where they gathered in, but most of them were yeah. widespread, very vulnerable, left themselves open. Another, yeah. I think. A, a, ta- a hugely dumb tactical error and a, a degree of either naivete or arrogance that they were just safe yeah. there. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. they came out and the target was to kill all of them. Now, mm-hmm. this is in line with what the Zulu had done. It's it's not, it mm-hmm. wasn't like it was, you know, there's the women and children going to go kill them. Mm-hmm. This was the enemy and that includes the women mm-hmm. and children yeah. and they would kill every yeah. last one of them, which is what the Zulu would do if you didn't submit yeah. to the Zulu kingdom. Is that accurate? Well, that's right. I mean, in battle, basically you'd, you would, you would capture the livestock, that, that was the prize, and mostly the, the women and children would be killed along with the men. You might take some women and some children captive to sort of lead a kind of captive life, um, sometimes even marrying into the, the Zulu elite and all the rest of it. But basically, you're out there to eliminate things. And look, there's another thing the Zulu always did. If you as a king took out an important chief, you executed him for some reason or another, you then eliminate his entire family and following so there would be no one to take revenge. So in a way, having having taken out Retief and, and, and his party, you have to. I mean, that is the way you do it. You take out the rest. That's 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 the norm, if you like. Yeah, you're almost obliged to do it. I mean, it's it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not exactly a uniquely Zulu trade. I mean, we saw this no, no, in, no, with no. the Golden Horde. We've seen this in Europe. Yeah. We've seen this in yeah. the Middle East all over. It's it's yeah. it's a, yeah. I don't yeah. want to say time honor, but a, a time practice, uh, time practice thing, sure. yeah, th- a thing to do. So let me ask this question. Now, I, I get this a lot uh, as an American, as political scientist, mm-hmm. historian. Who are you to, to, to talk about South African history? My, my response mm. to this one, Dr. LeBan, is, is often mm. that, well, um, last time I checked, I'm a homo sapien. And this is yeah. the history of homo sapiens. Um, yeah. I am welcome to study and become involved in any human history mm. or activity that I like to. Now, the reason I mention that is that when I talk to Zulu, Almost everyone I talk to, with rare exceptions, is wholly ignorant of their history of their country. I mean, honestly, no, look, I'm not throwing shade on the Zulu, but why anybody in the right mind would name an airport after Shaka, you know, from an objective <laughs> standpoint, a brutal, yeah. bloodthirsty, murdering yeah. empire builder. I mean, if you're going to do it, Kechaweo yeah. is a far more sympathetic figure to yeah. me and a successful yeah. king. Yeah. But I mean, but Zulu but, that but I met. Shaka's, yeah. Yeah, he's the founder. That 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 that's, that, that's, that, that's why. Well, but I mean, that's a yeah. pretty tough way. To, I mean, look, the yeah. The, yeah. The, the Serbians uh, look at the, the birth of the Serbian yeah. nation as the battle yeah. of the Kosovo Plogi when they got their hat yeah. handed to them and thirty thousand yeah. nobles were wiped out in thirteen eighty nine. Yeah, not yeah. exactly. You know, we have yeah. a much more auspicious start. We declared our independence yeah. and defeated the British. Yeah. But anyway, but seriously, yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah. for yourself, um, 
do you find a similar situation or, or do you think the Zulu are very well informed about their history and, and understanding? And the reason I ask that, because do you ever get any questions like, well, who are you as a white South African to tell me about yeah. Zulu history? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me answer that in two ways. When I used to lecture at, uni at the University of KwaZulu-Natal earlier, earlier in my career, I used to lecture on Zulu history. And most of those who took the course were obviously Zulu people, not one of whom had the foggiest idea about the history whatsoever. So it tends to be some, especially the more rural or old-fashioned areas, you get oral history is still being passed down, but for a modern generation, more urbanized and all the rest of it, this, this history has absolutely disappeared. It's not taught properly in schools, it never was, still, still isn't taught properly in schools. So there is a huge lack of knowledge about, about, about their own history, in fact. But still, at the same time, one does get the question, who are you as a white person to write about you know, Zulu history? Or who am I as an English speaker to write about Boer history? And you know, my answer is the same as yours. One tries to be an historian. You try and read what evidence there is. You try and speak to those people you can. And you bring your own perspective to it, which, of course, is your perspective. It could be problematic. It's not the only one. Um, history, as we know, is that famous debate without end. But, but there it is. If they're not going to write the history, then I'm writing the history. And if they don't like it, well, they can, can contest it. That's fine. <laughs> exactly. Like, well, here's my view. If you don't like it, then, then get out there and do the research and write it yourself, well, you know? I well, mean, exactly. I yeah. mean, honestly, yeah. I mean, when it comes to South African history, whether it's covering the Boers or covering the Anglophone uh, angle of it or or Tswana or, or yeah. Vende or Batsutu, whatever it is, I think that people should feel complimented that someone else takes an interest that's not from your group in your history. Yeah. I mean, especially if it's an objective. I mean, look, I've read this book. I've not read any of your other work, but I've read this book. And and I don't detect any inherent bias that is, you know, anti-Zulu or pro-Zulu. I, I think it's very in-depth on the Zulu. Um, uh, but I, I I mean, look, uh, that's my analysis of I don't see it. But I mean, yeah. that's how history should be. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I mean, basically, I, I was brought up in the school where as an historian, you try to be as empathetic as you can. You try and understand what's happening from the perspective of the people you're looking at. And when you play it that way, um, you can see both sides and you try and explain it. Um, you know, um, and you can come to whatever conclusions you like, but one tries to be as, 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 as informed and as even-handed as, as one can manage. Now, uh, your, your, your forte is Zulu history and, and military history of South Africa, but let me, let me go back Oh, about a millennium earlier, okay, if, if you mind, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, and I get your thoughts mm -hmm. on this. You know, I, I don't really care for the term colonizer. Uh, I get, I understand, mm -hmm. appreciate where it comes from. But from my perspective, the, the, the Bantu-speaking peoples who mm -hmm. came south, uh, the Nguni-speaking peoples, they were also mm -hmm. colonizers coming down the Rift Valley, mm -hmm. and they crossed the Zambezi and then the Pope about 1,600 years mm -hmm. ago. But before that, mm -hmm. you had Khoi and San and other groups running around, mm -hmm. mostly Khoi and San mm -hmm. in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when, when they throw that label of colonizers out, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, which ones are we talking about? The Bantus or the yeah. Europeans. <laughs> well, the, the only truly autochthonous people, in other words, the, the original livers on the land were the San. Even the even the Khoi, in fact, in the came down migrate. later yes, on. Yes. Yeah. So so everyone except the San should get out. <laughs> <laughs> has has arrived. They have, you know, taken land, they've intermarried perhaps, they've turned the other people into serfs or servants or whatever they might be. But sure, everyone is indeed, you know, a colonist. Except exactly. The it's, it's the history yeah, of, of, yeah. of humanity. You know, it's interesting well, because right. Liberia, yeah. of course, I, I worked in Liberia, rebuilt the armed force of Liberia, and mm. Liberia has a long association with America. Mostly Liberia with America. Yeah. Most Americans don't even know where we have any association with Liberia. But yeah. I often get this from students at university and in graduate school mm. even. You know, the only countries in Africa never colonized. And of course, Ethiopia mm. comes up and then they mm. talk about Liberia. But that's total nonsense. Liberia mm. was colonized by former mm. slaves and free black Americans who went to Liberia and the mm. very definite of colonization in my book they impose an alien political system mm -hmm. in which they ruled the roost on the local exactly. population that's colonization exactly. that's yeah, what colonization yeah. is yeah yeah sure no, Sierra Leone was no different you know yeah. so I mean it's, it's just yeah yeah so it's, it's yeah no 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 indeed I mean that is the story of humanity if you like 
Agreed. And that's, I mean, that's exactly my point. And that's why people, you know, people I think should, should get away from that, that label of colonizer yeah. and just talk about injustices yeah. or unfair yeah. things. I think that's a more, much more appropriate. Yeah. In fact, speaking of that, one of my viewers just mentioned that Nando's effort, Nando's is cheeky. Uh, you found us here, the sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. so true though. They really, that's so yeah. true. Yeah. 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 So, so, what sparked your interest in Zulu history? Look, I mean, I know why my interest in South Africa came about. I read James Mincher's book, The Covenant, and that really inspired me to become a you know a person involved in South Africa. But what got yeah. you into the Zulu? I mean, did you grow up in the area? What's the deal? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I grew up in South Africa, and I spent a lot of time in in the Zulu part of the world. But but in fact, my my real interest, I mean, when I was at Cambridge University, was actually India and the Indian Mutiny. I mean, India and stuff is what I seen the direction I seemed to be going, but when I got a job back in South Africa lecturing, I couldn't pursue the Indian thing. And yeah, that's kind of like a lead, that's kind of like a lead <laughs> balloon yeah. in South Africa. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I mean, here, here was all the stuff on 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 my doorstep, and I was extremely fortunate. I had a colleague, Paul Thompson, who actually he's um, he was a graduate of VMI and, and the University of Virginia. And so he's a military historian in his own right of, of the Civil War, in fact. But he also had a job in South Africa. And we began work on the Anglo-Zulu War. I mean, it, the centenary was coming up, so it seemed a good idea. And it really developed from there. And I got more and more into it and wider and wider. So, so there, those were actually my beginnings. It's sort of the Indian mutiny <laughs> transported into South Africa and took it from there. Well, I suppose there's a not really an angle to it, but there are a significant number of Indians who are brought there as, as sugarcane workers. Yeah. Uh, so there's an Indian and, connection there, and 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 they're the British, always the British, who always the British, part, yeah, always the British. Part, part in the scene, yeah. In fact, yeah. they all need to take their oath this weekend to the new king, <laughs> the Brits. Yeah, that. <laughs> No, that, that's right. That's so, right. so yeah. one thing as a historian that's challenging is you know you go to a lot of places in temperate zones or or desert yeah. regions, and yeah. we can be aided. I mean, historians can rely on linguistics. That's a useful tool to to follow history. Yeah. We can also rely yeah. on DNA these days. That helps with yeah. history. Yeah. We can rely yeah. on more traditional things like oral history, written documents, yeah. and archaeology. Yeah. But in Africa, yeah. much of the middle band of Africa is tropical, and things just yeah. don't survive in that yeah. environment. Yeah. Unless yeah. they're made out of metals or stone. Yeah. Now, if you go to Songhai and Mali, there are records yeah. because the Islamization yeah. that took place, the literacy, yes. and and so mm. we can trace that history that way. And there's also archaeology. In Great Zimbabwe, there's a huge settlement which we can we can look at from an archaeological perspective. But the nature of kingdoms that formed up in what is today Botswana, Zimbabwe, South mm. Africa, these mm. are mostly, in many respects, transitory um, populations yeah. that moved about with cattle and such, and they didn't build permanent structures beyond thatch <laughs> and wood. Um, is is that a major impediment or difficulty? Um, not having um, a good access, or is that accurate too? Not having good access yeah. to archaeological evidence when you do research in southern africa well i mean thank goodness for middens and things like that i mean uh, well <laughs> they, if, you they, they, they through, if you want to pick through refuse <laughs> but it's a very yeah. i mean yeah it works yeah yeah and and places like gungunclovo and ondini um they, they were put to the torch many of these great um military homesteads are put to the torch so they actually baked the um the cow, the, the cow dung, and 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 bare hole sand, etc. So you've got archaeological sites there that you actually can excavate, and you can go to Ngonga Clovo, and you can actually they've, or part of it's been ploughed and all the rest of it, but you can actually reconstruct, you know, what the Isigotlo, the Harim area looked like, and all the rest of it. So so there is archaeological um, evidence there. In fact, it's somewhat easier for earlier periods. Um, the, the very early sort of centuries before this, when people were building huts out of out of with with stone walls and all the rest of it, that's a lot easier for archaeologists. But as you say, when you're dealing with these cow dung and and ant bear sand floors and thatch, um, not that much is left. So you do depend on you know, middens and all the rest of it. And and I remember, I mean, I had a friend who worked for years at Mgonga Clovo. I mean, with a fine tooth comb, picking up these tiny little archaeological bits and pieces to try and get some sense of what beads they had and, you know, what pottery they had. But there is not much in the archaeological line, in fact. No. Well, you know, 
John, it's it's very fascinating history, not just the Zulu, but the whole region. And perhaps I get you back another time. We can talk about more Southern African military history. I mean, um, I'm not that familiar with 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 your background. Now, I know you from this book, and then I did a little yeah. research on you. Right, but yeah. Um, yeah. It, it does does you does your interest and expertise extend to places like what is today Namibia and Angola, uh, Botswana, Zimbabwe? Um, I've, I've really concentrated on South. Southern Africa. And at one stage, I did a fair amount of work with the Portuguese in the early period in Africa as well. Um, and, and certainly military history of Africa, really in the colonial period. I'd, I've not been so much modern as the colonial period. And I have looked at lots of other parts of Africa in the colonial period. And phenomenon that, that really interests me is the whole business of slave soldiers in Africa, for example. The, the ubiquity of the number of societies that depended on slave soldiers. Um, not in Southern Africa, but especially in the Maghreb and, and West Africa and elsewhere. I mean, slave soldiers were absolutely basic to the number of the way a number of these kingdoms actually operated. So that's sort of a sideline I got, got, got into at one stage. You know. Well, that's fascinating. Maybe we could talk about that and delve into that yeah. one day. That's an yeah. interesting discussion. Yeah. The uh, yeah. well, would would you be a, a person that could talk, uh, you know, informatively or authoritatively about Morosi and um, and the the, uh, the with the was he the Baputi? I think people Baputi people Morosi down there. Yeah. Yeah, not not particularly. No, no. I, I know who you mean, but not not my not my well, that, area. That's I mean, that's a fascinating yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, um, and the, yeah. and the, the descendants of, of those folks are still fighting for their rights inside Lesotho today. They're still trying to yeah, claim, no, sure, yeah, no, sure. They're still trying to claim yeah. things when they were wiped yeah. out by colonial forces from the Cape who came yeah. up there in yeah. the long siege. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, sure. Yes, no, no. no. Hey, so yeah. here's let's let's go back to the Zulu before we before we wrap up here. Um, mm. at the Blood River, okay, in Kome. So right. the, there's there's these models of the little cannon or mortars that they that they used, uh, and the, the stories there were three of them. But uh, I find conflicting evidence from different authors about what really yeah. happened. You got what yeah. old Griki, I think, is the one that was brought yeah. there, yeah. and then and then yeah. one of them apparently it, it failed after one or two rounds or something like that. Do you yeah. do you know the story? Were there actually three? artillery devices there and, and I, they had a big impact I, I, or what I, I i can't be absolutely sure about it i mean you know i don't think anybody can at this stage yeah. Anyway, can't, yeah. um i mean look they're, they're operating like 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 big shotguns i mean they're not shooting cannonballs they're they're they're, they're shooting you know canister or, or whatever or you know? a grape I mean, shot or something like that a grape shot yeah yeah i mean they're, 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 that's what they're basically doing um so it's and i'm not sure how great a part they actually played you know i think far more effective was the steady rolling fire of, of uh, the, the musketry fire, which they could, were able, you know, to sort of keep up a fairly steady, steady roll of it. So that, 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 that's what worked, you yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's it's. I think it's a fascinating thing, and this I will use the term mythology for the Afrikaner, yeah. the Boer mythology. Yeah. Those cannons yeah. do play a, a mythological role in in, in what I happened know. there, um, and know. that's why it's, I think it's an interesting thing in the story. But we'll never fully yeah. know. I don't think the true no, story. No, we can't. Yeah. No, now, I mean this is the yeah. So go go on, go on. Yeah. No, no, no. Have have, have no, you? No. Uh, obviously, I would imagine you've been to the Four Tracker Monument and seen the frieze oh, yeah. along yeah. the wall. Uh, very yeah. interesting. A, a lot of effort put yeah. into that monument. Yeah. But but indeed no. Um, there, there, there are two marvelous new books by um, oh God, Schroeder and I can't, can't remember offhand at the moment. But which are the two great books actually on the freeze. In fact, um, yeah. I, I, I could let you know. I mean, they're they're really worth were worth getting. And in fact, um, Stanford, I know you you can actually access um, the visuals on 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 the freeze. So, um, so Stanford's actually got them. But I, I'll I'll send you that. But please do. But yeah, yeah. So it's but again it's. The free certainly is a very, well, it's of its time, you know. <laughs> it's it's of um, Africana pride, and and um, at the moment when they were in there, three of the Brits that they're, they're ruling the roost, and and they were so approach, they were approaching their ascendancy of political power at that stage. That, that's right. So so it really is a monument to to their success over over the savages and the heathens and all such. <laughs> Well, I don't think the Democrats play a role in this here in America. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Heathens and savages. Sorry, I, I, I digress. No, but seriously. <laughs> so so uh, you mentioned you're working on uh, something else right now. What, what's your next work? Can you tell us, or is that like yeah. a state secret? No, no, sure. It's coming out fairly soon. Um, General Lord Chelmsford, who um, 
was a guy who messed up at the Saint Laurent uh, and the Sioux du War. Bit of an asshat. <laughs> well, yeah, I've but he had a long, interesting career before Sioux yes. and elsewhere. Yeah. So, so it's a big fat book on his on his whole life. Really, it's the biography of a Victorian soldier of the elite um, who's getting where he is. Not so much because of what he does, but who he is and oh. how he is, and how patronage works and all the rest of it, and how he screws it up and why. And so, so that that's what the book essentially is about, and and how being a great member of the establishment, he manages to ride through all the scandals and failures, and still ends up a courtier, and you know, you know, goes into a gilded retirement. So. And remembered in history, even though he should remembered be, in history should be consigned as, to the as, dustbin of military failure, in my view. But <laughs> absolutely, but 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 you know. He's part of a whole milieu, if you like, of Victorian aristocratic soldiering. And that, in many ways, is what the book's actually about and what's wrong with it and why it's not so successful. Now, let me get your take on this, because, you know, Hollywood uh, is for entertainment and making money. But mm. sometimes it gets things uh, maybe not right, but not bad. Let me get mm. your take on this. I would assume you've seen Michael Caine's first ever motion picture, which was Zulu. Yeah, surely. Uh, yeah. What do you, what's your take? And I understand Mango Sudo Butelezi played in that as, as one of the mm. one of the actors there. But um, what uh, what are your thoughts on that movie? It's now been, what, uh, gone on 60 years almost since it was produced. Well, Well, now, in fact, certainly in England, it's been sort of... It's it's fallen prey to um, the the new sort of political environment. The so woke environment. So, yeah, so it's considered a very bad thing. In fact, um, <laughs> anyway, um, in many ways, um, Zulu Dawn, the one, the subsequent one about Isant Juan itself, is probably more historically accurate. Mm. Um, but Zulu itself, I mean, it's it gets the feel of you know, I mean. Forget all the details and this and that. I think it really captures, from the British point of view, what something like that is what actually about. I think I think it's very good. I mean, it's it's um, you know, as I say, unfashionable as it is to be behind the barricades and be a British soldier defending yourself, it 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 does capture it extremely well. I think, and I mean, this is why it's. I mean, so many people have got onto the Zulu War because of that film. And, yes, and, uh, same here, it's, right here. Yeah, yeah, and and it's still, as I say, has this kind of, you know status which politically incorrect or not is not going to go away yeah well for mm. me you know a lot of people the politically the woke crowd is talking about you know how it portrays mm. the zulu poorly i didn't come away from the movie with anything but interest and a degree of respect for the zulu now mm. and that once I, you know once i started investigating it and understanding that the the impies weren't supposed to be there and they disobeyed the king uh, that respect mm. declined a little bit but the yeah. portrayal in the movie i, I don't mm. see it as particularly problematic of the zulu it didn't lead me no. to think anything i certainly no, no, didn't, I, I didn't form a white supremacy group based on it you know <laughs> no no, no I, I don't think i mean again it was really pretty well done because for the film to work the attacking zulu had to seem menacing and effective of course which they were which they were so so as you say i don't see the problem except well that's how things are yeah well with that uh, i have to unfortunately slip away today to go to training i'm a judge of elections and my volunteers are getting trained today and i have to go through their session to see what they're taught oh, right. yeah so right. uh, make sure we have free and fair elections but uh it's, yeah, it's, right. an, ele it's an elected well no one no one actually um stood for the role I, I went to the primaries there was no one on the party that i vote yeah. for and then i went to the yeah. general election I, I got the ballot for the general election a few months before and there was no one on the ballot and i'm like that's kind yeah. of an important job particularly after 2020 somebody should step forward so i did a writing yeah. campaign and got elected so I, yeah now, oh, well, now, well, now i have a job are. so i have to do I have it a job. good well but enjoy it <laughs> well we'll see uh, the, yeah. the election day yeah. is actually yeah. it's a great experience it's nice to see people participate yeah. in that but um but with that we're going to have to wrap it up here and i, I want to thank you an awful lot for for being well, so receptive well, pleasure. yeah it's, pleasure, it's, pleasure. It's, a, it's a pleasure here too and i'd yeah. like to get yeah. you back on we'll talk about some yeah. other things if you don't mind sometime in the future right okay one of these days absolutely good Excellent. Folks, okay. uh, Dr. John Laban, Laban, or as I say, Laban, Laban because I speak German, but uh, Dr. Laban, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, historian uh, from South Africa. Thank you so much, sir. I'll let you drop off and I'll wrap up my broadcast. Thank you so much for your time. Right. Thanks very much. Okay. Ciao. Bye. All right. Okay, uh, folks. I cut I, off. Yeah. Yeah, I'll let you get off there. Okay.
There he goes. He's gone. Folks, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I found it um, fascinating. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope that that was something productive for you. Feel free to leave a comment behind. Give a like or dislike if you want. Um, you know, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, thanks to Dr. LeBan. It was a real pleasure to talk about this. We went all over the place from Blood River to Pete Retief to, you know, even uh, Basutu land, you know, and other things. I hope that was something you found enjoyable. And um, I will be doing the news tonight. So for South Africans, you'll probably be asleep. Uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, midnight South Africa. I'll be doing the news. Uh, Chris White reports. You can watch it tomorrow if you miss it. There's a lot of stuff breaking today, a lot of news out there. And so I'm going to do it, but I have to run off to training now. So uh, thank you. Uh, Fiona says, thanks for an awesome stream. Have a super evening. Well, Fiona, who's from the area, actually, uh, White Zulu enjoyed it. Then um, there must have been something interesting to it. Charles Van Onselen enjoyed it as well. Thank you for that. LMC. Um, yeah, you guys are talking about, you know, nasty words. Why are you talking about that? Talk about something positive. Anyway, so I hope you came away with this from with from this with perhaps more interest in the Zulu and uh, the Boer who were engaged in this um, hmm, conflict in the 1830s. Anyway, thanks a lot, folks. The Great Trek didn't start in Cape Town. I never said it started in Cape Town. Who said that? Anyway, thank you. George says very informative. And that's it, guys. Uh, I'll catch you later. Have a lovely day. And for those who are up late tonight or true night owls in South Africa, you can catch the news this evening. Thank you all so much. And I do appreciate it. Don't forget, tomorrow in Rugby as Senate, um, I will have um, the Greek was hosting the Lions on Rugby Senate. Then we'll do the news after that right here on this channel. Uh, as far as tomorrow, I have Dr. Corne Mulder from the Freedom Front Plus who's lined up to talk to me about Johannesburg's municipality and what's going on there with the mayor. I have not confirmed if it's going to be tomorrow. If it's tomorrow, it will be earlier at 2 p.m. most likely. Otherwise, maybe over the weekend. Also, uh, for those who are interested, uh, Skulk Berger, Springbok, not not the young Skulk Berger, younger Skulk Berger who played for Saracens and is a Springbok um, and a World Cup winner. But his father, the owner of the Velbedoc Wine Estate in uh, Wellington, will be my guest sometime soon, maybe on Sunday or Tuesday. We'll be talking about Afrikaans culture and language for those who are curious, and you can welcome to tune in on that. Those banners will go up as soon as I confirm those interviews. So thank you all very much. Doc Breaker says, thank you, Colonel Joy Stream, very much. As did I, Doc Breaker. It was a lot of fun. Good to see you again, man. I love that username. I've always loved it. it makes me think of vampires. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a lovely, lovely evening. Take care of yourselves. Be safe out there. Uh, keep your doors and windows locked and um, don't take any wooden nickels because they just don't work. Cheers, everybody.